speaker is Roy Amir from the School of Chemistry. Uh, so Roy did his PhD in Tel Aviv University, then a postdoc in University of California, Santa Barbara. And in 2012, Roy joined the School of, uh, the School of Chemistry in Tel Aviv University. He won the PMSE for Young Investigator by the Division of Polymeric Material Award. Um, is now the, in the academic board of the Blavatnik Center for Drug Discovery, discovery um, in charge of the Medicinal Chemistry Unit. And just last week, he won the Young uh, Investigator Award from the Israel Chemistry Society. And we have the presentation. <coughs> Okay, Lee, thank you very much for the introduction. And I would say for the young uh, scientists in the room that you can choose, there's no better job than an academic job which allows you to be 45 and still be considered young. <laughs> so, Lee, thank you again for mentioning this. So, uh, I would uh, describe to you today the, the work or, or a lot of the work that we've done in the past uh, seven years since I actually uh, started my lab. And uh, we'll focus on the role of molecular precision in designing enzymatically uh, degradable amphi polymeric amphiphiles. So the motivation for doing so is the fact that many of the drugs that are being used today in the clinic are low molecular weight hydrophobic drugs, which therefore have poor solubility. They can get clear very rapidly from the circulation due to their low molecular weight. They can get degraded quickly before they uh, reach uh, their target and they're very often non-specific, leading to different side effects. So here you can think on two approaches, either design better drugs or design nanocarriers that would allow to encapsulate hydrophobic drugs in their core. This should improve the solubility. Such nano objects in the sizes of a, a tens to 100 nanometer should have a, a longer <laughs> elongated circulation times in the body. The nanocarrier can protect the drugs from degradation and potentially we can also target such nanocarriers, and we've seen very beautiful in the talk of Tiny Rail, different approaches of targeting such assemblies to a specific site in the body or specific cells. Now it is clear and that if we take an amphiphilic block of polymer and we throw it into water, it would form such my micellar assemblies or other assemblies. It's clear that if we want to use these assemblies as a nanocarrier, we need to have two main characteristics. One is we need the assembly to be extremely stable, so it will be able to circulate through the body until it reaches the target site. And at the same time, we need some type of a release mechanism. So the, eventually, when the carrier reaches its target, it will be able to release the drugs. And I would argue that the best release mechanism would be such that the hydrophobic part would become a hydrophilic one. This would allow the nanocarrier to disassemble, but would also form hydrophilic polymer that now can be extruded from the body. If you do other types of changes, such as breaking the bond between the hydrophilic and hydrophobic, this may also lead to the uh, release of drugs, but would leave chunks of hydrophobic, usually non very degradable uh, polymers behind. Now, my group specifically is interested in designing or studying this type of release mechanism, and we're focusing mostly on the use of enzyme or understanding whether we can use enzymes to degrade and change the hydrophobic part of the assembly into hydrophilic. And the main motivation is the fact that there is more, a lot of information on enzymes that are overexpressed in specific diseases. And if we can learn how to design such nanocarriers that will respond to these specific enzymes, then we should be able to achieve the selective release of drugs only at the site of disease. Now, I'm quite aware, even though I'm a chemist by, by training, that enzymes don't have sharp teeth and they're usually not very green. But for the rest of my talk, this comes from an afternoon that I was spending time with the kids trying to explain to them what I do at work. And my enzyme is kind of chopping red chunks to make them into a blue hydrophilic one. And there, when it got the teeth, it, for some time, it also had an eye on it. It got removed before it got to the cover of Jack's few years ago. So this is our goal, is to see how can we use enzymes to change the hydrophobic part of my cellular assemblies in order to release molecular cargo from inside. Now, we were very worried that if you look on this type of structure, 
that from the perspective of the enzyme, a group that might be here or a group that might be very close to the hydrophilic part are actually in a very different environment, even if it's the same functional group. And therefore, we went for another molecular design, which is this PEG, a hydrophilic a polymer and a, a hybrid with a dendron. And the dendron have, will have hydrophobic end groups that are linked for enzymatic cleavable bonds. And the idea here is that now all groups are essentially the same. They're all terminal groups. And also in the way that we know how to make dendrons, we can make them very monodispersed. So we can be sure that our polymer have the exact, each polymer would have the exact number and distribution and type of hydrophobic end groups. Now, I was definitely not the first one to come up with the hybridization of a linear polymer and, and a hydrophobic dendrimer. This was introduced in the early 90s by Jean Frechet, Craig Hawker, which I had the pleasure of doing my postdoc with, and then adopted by different scientists around the world. Whenever someone wants to gain the benefit of polymer chemistry, which is relatively more easy than organic chemistry, combined with the high molecular precision of dendrimers. So you can precisely tune the number of functional groups that you have in your structure. So we came up with a very simple chemistry to do it. We start with a pegamine. We designed this a branching unit in the lab. We create this amide bond and two triple bonds. Then we take a tile that already functionalized with a hydrophobic end groups and a cleavable ester bond right here. And for a tile line chemistry, we can functionalize the both uh, triple bonds and create this dendron, which is uh, schematically uh, illustrated here. To give an appreciation of how precise and well-defined is our structure, and I'm pretty sure that this would be the only proton NMR you would see in this nano uh, workshop, uh, conference, uh, workshop. You can see a proton NMR, and for the organic chemists or polymer chemists in the crowd, you would appreciate that for a molecular weight of more than six kilodalton, this is a very, very good looking NMR. You can precisely uh, determine and associate all the peaks, calculate J-coupling constant, and so really the high molecular precision of the dendrons is coming through in this proton enema. We then use an array of different techniques, start including a dynamic light scattering, TEM. We see that we have micelles of around 20 nanometers, both in the DLS and TEM. We encapsulate a solvatochromic dye inside to measure the CMC, the critical micelle concentration. At a very low concentration of the polymer, the fluorescence is very low because then most of the nitrate molecules are in the hydrophilic aqueous environment. And when you start forming micelles, the red is migrating or finding this hydrophobic core and its fluorescence go up. This is also a very nice experiment. This is NMR, but this time it's in D2O. And here, the proton that I was just bragging about in the last slide disappeared due to the fact that all the protons that are here in the core are collapsed. Their mobility really decreases. Relaxation time becomes extremely short and then basically the peaks become so broad they disappear from the spectra. So for us, it's a great indication for what's in the core and what's in the shell when you go into aqua solution. We then use an array of different, of kind of the same techniques to characterize the disassembly. So we can go to the DLS and see the disappearance of the bigger micellar structure and formation of structure that we can associate with the free polymer. We can take the Nile red loaded micelles, add the enzyme, and we see a decrease in fluorescence indicating that the Nile red is being released into the solution. We can analyze our polymer mixture by HPLC because, again, our hydrophobic part is exactly the same for all polymers. So if we have partial degradation and one group is coming after the other, we can follow it by conventional HPLC. And then we can plot the HPLC results together with the fluorescence one. And in this case, we could actually observe that it was enough to cleave one group from each polymer in order to completely disassemble the micelles. So this is, again, something that comes uh, uh, available only due to the high molecular precision of our system that allow us to analyze this result in the, such a high uh, resolution and a degree of precision by the HPLC and combine it with other techniques that are very popular in polymer chemistry. So the question we kind of ask ourselves in the beginning is how, how does it happen? How can an enzyme reach groups that should be buried in a hydrophobic core and protected with a hydrophilic shell around it? So one option is that the enzyme can shove itself in through the PEG shell and get to the core. And the other one is that the, peg, the enzyme actually can get access to the monomers through this uh, equilibrium between monomer and micelles. And I think it's extremely important to understand which of these two mechanisms, or maybe both, is happening to design a, a better uh, drug delivery systems. So we call this the direct enzymatic attack, an equilibrium-dependent uh, mechanism. And in the 
past uh, four or five years, we actually took this very modular system and we changed different parameters with very high degree of molecular precision. So we made very small changes, such as in the length of the peg, the hydrophobicity of the n-groups, how many n-groups we have, and what type are they. This would be determine also the enzymatic activity, the overall molecular weight, and also we are playing right now with the type of polymers. So I've shown you how we can make polymers with four n-groups. Let me show you how we can make polymers with three n-groups or six n-groups by changing, simply changing the, uh, our branching unit and keeping the synthesis extremely simple. And just a schematic representation, we can make dendrons having all the way from three to 12 end groups, and we can play with them. All of them are being synthesized through the same three synthetic steps that I've shown you before. Now, in the past four years since, or past five years actually, since we started this, we've been really, uh, I would say, lucky, this, unlike some of the other molecules that I've designed before, this one behaved really nice, both in terms of the synthesis, really high yielding uh, uh, synthesis, and we could really kind of really study this system very well, changing again a parameter at a time, and understanding how this change of parameter influenced the stability and the ability of the polymer amphiphas to form these masses and also degrade. And what we've studied when all of our kinetic uh, uh, data really points to the fact that the enzyme cannot penetrate through the dense peg shell, and it's kind of limited to access the monomers that are being expelled out of the micelles, either through this, again, through this equilibrium. Now, a question we keep our, uh, asking ourselves is, how far does a polymer have to get out of the micelle to be cleaved? Is it enough to get to the surface, and it's already accessible there, or does it have to go all the way out? Which is something that is, is not simple to uh, understand. After all, getting to the surface is the first part of getting outside is something we try to understand right now. Now, one of the things we, we also uh, uh, understood quite rapidly, and, and, and the more we, we looked into it, the more it became clear, that if you want to increase micellar stability, you need to increase hydrophobicity. Or you can increase your molecular weight, overall molecular weight of your amphiphas. However, what we also found out is that you pay very fast in enzymatic responsiveness. The more stable your micelles are, the less responsive they become. So just to give you a slight feeling of how you could use or the power of molecular precision in understanding this fine balance between hydrophobicity and enzymatic responsiveness, I want to show you the following slides. So we take a peg that has four hydroxyl groups with our dendron, and we do the last coupling with a mixture of hexanoic and nonanoic acid. So they are different from each other by three carbons, and we make it with a one-to-one -one mixture. We're expecting to get a statistical mixture from four hexanoic all the way to four nonanoic. And to basically, again, get a statistical mixture, if I would ask my student to separate this on a prep HPLC, they will all leave the group probably. But luckily, again, we can inject it to the HPLC and do get a baseline separation between the different peaks. You can see here the four nonanoic and the four hexanoic by itself. And we can see that we are getting exactly the same number of peaks that we were expecting. We characterize it also by MALDI. So we know what we have in the mixture. Now, if these polymers hydrolyze by the enzyme, they all give the same structure, the peg with the four hydroxyl group. Now, what amazed me is the fact that, again, these peaks are different from each other by only three carbons, because it's a difference between the chains. And if you look at the rate of degradation, the rate of degradation is extremely different. So you take a polymer that weighs six kilodalton, or 6.3, and you increase its molecular weight by three CH2 units, and you get different rate, degradation rate, and another one, and another one. And I think that this results, even though, again, in this paper, all we've done is made polymer and understand their, uh, enzymatic, their, their self assembly and enzymatic degradation. We did not encapsulate any drugs. I think that this type of resolution and understanding actually explain, actually explain why many a polymeric carrier, hydrophilic polymers that are decorated with hydrophobic drugs in a random way, even if you control the average number, you don't know the exact number on each polymer chain and its location. This may lead to the fact that polymers that have too many drugs actually self-assemble into non-degradable structure and they don't exchange that fast with the solution. And the ones that have fewer number of drugs can exchange, but this means that you're releasing only a small percentage of the drug and a lot of the drugs stay encapsulated. Now this is very true, I think, to enzymatically degradable structures, 
Obviously, for pH and other type of stimuli, this does not hold because, again, a proton has no problem of migrating into such a polymeric micelles. But if you think on an enzyme that have a comparable size to the micelle and it needs to penetrate inside the assembly, again, it most likely depends on this equilibrium. With this, we, we got quite a lot of, I would say, quite a lot of understanding, again, of how molecular changes in our polymeric amplifiers influence the stability and the enzymatic degradation rates. But we wanted to go further. And we wanted to study these polymeric mices in a more complex environment. After all, they are designed to eventually become nanocarriers. So we want to study them, for example, in cell medium or, or later in, in serum and blood. And it's quite difficult to do a DLS and understand whether you have mice or not if you walk inside serum. So we wanted to design polymeric mice that would be able to report their structural change. So going from a mice to a, a, a either a disassembled polymer or degraded polymer by changing their spectral properties and creating some spectral response that we can follow. In order to do so, we took our molecular design, we introduced another linker here that we can covalently label with a fluorescent dye, and this means that we can tune the fluorescence properties of our amphiphile. When we throw the amphiphile into water, it should self-assemble into micelles, and our, poly our dyes should be in very close proximity right at the interface between the core and the shell, and when fluorescent dyes are in close proximity, they can interact with each other, and the type of interaction depends on the type of the dye. So you can think on dyes that go self-quenching and would lead to a micelle that doesn't have any fluorescence or very weak fluorescence. We can mix amphiphiles with a dye and a dark quencher, again leading to micelles that have, would have very weak fluorescence. Or we can mix polymers that have two different dyes leading to a, such a, a threat pair or eczema formation. These would lead to micelles that have different spectral properties. They have basically emitting a different color. And then when we introduce the enzyme and the degradation, the enzyme is not going to do anything to the dye itself. It's going to cleave the hydrophobic end groups from the other side of the polymer. But now the polymers will become hydrophilic. If they would become hydrophilic, the micelles should disassemble. The polymers should get further away from each other, leading to change in the fluorescent property of the labeling moiety back to the intrinsic spectral properties of the dye that you introduced. So let me give you two quick examples of this. In one, we label the polymer with fluorescein. Fluorescein, again, is a dye that has very uh, high quantum yield, but also very small stock shift, and therefore tend to self-quench when in close proximity. And you can see polymeric mice that have very weak fluorescence and increase by uh, order of magnitude um, in, in, the, in the fluorescence. You can see here the photo, again, very weak fluorescence in the beginning and very strong fluorescence after the enzymatic, after the addition of the enzyme. We've done the same with a coumarin dye that can form eczema, and here, here we had this a yellowish, greenish uh, fluorescence in the beginning, so a very significant red shift that upon the addition of the enzyme, this wavelength decrease and this one increase. This system, even though the photos don't look as impressive as here, is actually a better system because now we can track both wavelengths as an indication of whether the mices are assembled or disassembled, and you don't depend only on one wavelength. And we could take this system and throw it into cells. And what you can see here, that we did this basically uh, confocal fluorescence imaging, in, in each pixel, we took a fluorescent spectrum, and then we looked at the two wavelengths, and we created this bar that if the wavelength fits to a monomer or the wavelength fits to a, or the ratio between the two wavelengths fits to a micelle. You can see here our hydrophilic precursor, all purple, which means that it's monomeric form. Surprisingly, it does go into the cells. It seems to penetrate through the membrane and go to the ER from some colocalization. You can see that for the amphiphilic structure, when we are increasing hydrophobicities, we go in this direction. They're all greenish on the outside of the cells, meaning that they are in their assembled micellar form. These two, which have lower degree of hydrophobicity, seem to go through the same mechanism, so they seem to go to the ER. This one has C8, four C8 chains, and there's very significant accumulation on the membrane, and it goes both to the ER, but mostly to the uh, lysosome for uh, basically endocytosis. And if we look on this one that have a C11, four C11 chains, you can see that they go inside the cell even as they're extremely stable, kinetically stable, so they go inside the cell as a, a micelle, and then after half an hour, we can already see them starting to disassemble. Now, I can't tell you whether they got degraded or disassembled due to their interaction with proteins and the membrane inside the endosome, 
we need to design a better system that would allow us to distinguish between the cleavage or just the disassembly of the polymers. But this is actually very interesting that you can tune the kind of the target cellular co compartment by changing the hydrophobicity, by small changes of the hydrophobicity of your polymeric amplifier or your uh, delivery system. I want to show you also kind of an appreciation of how, again, small changes influence the rate of, of exchange. So we took micelles and we labeled them polymers with Psi-3 or Psi-5, which make a great a threat pair. Again, small changes in the hydrophobicity, adding two carbons at a time to the end groups. And here you can see that if we take the, the polymers that have hexanoic, uh, by the time we get to the, fluor to the fluorimeter, they're already exchanged. So we start with two separate solutions. One is labeled only with Psi-3, the other one is only with Psi-5. By the time you start measuring, there's already maximum threat. If we go to the C11, you can see that you mix them, but basically almost nothing happens. The process of exchange of monomers between these two mices is extremely slow. And you can see very stable mices, again, as indicated also by the cell experiment. And you can see that with a C8, 4 C8 chains, you have very nice a, a exchange rate where you can follow very easily, so this wavelength decrease of the Psi-3, and you can see more and more threat occurring, again, due to the packing of mixed labeled monomers inside each of the micelles. Again, extremely small changes in terms, so the changes here are actually smaller than the changes in the polydispersity that comes from the polydispersity of the peg, even though it's a peg of around 1.05. So relatively narrow, but again, the change in the hydrophobic part are extremely important. With this, I'd like to kind of uh, make a, a small summary. So I think that really the high molecular precision we have really allow us to dig into the detailed mechanism of how enzymes can degrade polymeric amplifiers. And again, focusing especially on the hydrophobic part. We, we were able to use, again, the molecular precision to follow how very small changes can make a big difference in the enzymatic degradation rate and stability of micelles. And I think that the self-reporting micelles really open exciting opportunities for future work. But if we think about it, and as I tell my students, so far in the last few years, we actually haven't solved any problem. We actually made it worse. It's now clear that you need to increase hydrophobicity, and it's clear that the more we increase hydrophobicity, our polymer will become less and less responsive. So if this was kind of a notion that wasn't extremely clear in the literature before, now we kind of put it up front. And so we need to find a solution how to overcome this stability, enzymatic responsiveness challenge. And the way we started working towards this uh, possible solution, one of them is to combine light and enzymatic responsiveness. The idea is to use azobenzene end group that are, can be non-polar or a bit more polar when they go from trans to cis azomerization. So you can see here a system that has four azobenzene group, and they are linked through an ester bond to our dendron. If they are in the trans form, then they are again, less polar, more hydrophobic, and therefore the micelles are extremely stable, and we can see very low degree of degradation with adding the enzyme. However, if we irradiate them, the transform, the trans as a benzene, transform into cis, it's not, the change is not big enough to break the micelles, but it's big enough to, ex, to enhance this exchange of micelle monomer, and then the enzyme can reach this, the one that becomes cis, cleave the ester, and you can see here that we get very high degree of cleavage. As they go, thermally go back to the trans, we need to give them another pulse, another UV pulse, and then we can get almost to a full degradation of our polymeric micelles and obviously release whatever they were carrying inside. So this is one approach, combining light and enzymatic responsiveness in order to fine tune this balance between the micelle and the monomer. And another approach is to use this reversible dimerization. We basically took our amphiphas, we introduced a tile, I'll show the structure in a second, this can form disulfide in solution, and there we can have micelles that are based on amplifiers that basically have exactly twice the molecular weight of the parent amplifier. And these were found, as I'll show you in the next slide, to be extremely stable against enzymatic degradation. If you reduce this back to the monomeric uh, form, then they go very rapid enzymatic degradation. Here is the structure. We have four ester group, it's enzymatically responsive. We have one tile. And as a control, we have this methyl TO ether that cannot, cannot go oxidation. If you look on the GPC, this is the starting material. We oxidize, we get double the molecular weight, and we can reduce it back to the monomer. If we take the micelles and we oxidize, so they're built from a dimeric uh, amphiphiles, 
and we add the enzyme, nothing happens. This is following the release of a fluorescent dye. If we take the dimer and add the reducing agent, nothing happens as well because your artifacts are still intact and they still form these micelles. So the micelles are still there. And it's only if you add both the enzyme and the reducing agent is that you see a decrease in fluorescence or degradation as we follow by HPLC. And you can see that it follows the exact same line of the monomeric one, the one with the methyl group here that cannot go this dimerization. And we can see exactly the same trends and rates both in the fluorescence and in the HPLC results. With this, I hope that I managed to convince you that even in the world of polymer chemistry, I think this is a point also Tanya made before, high molecular precision is still extremely important. Now, it might not be important in the hydrophilic part, or not as important in the hydrophilic part, but it's extremely important on the hydrophobic side of your amplifiers. And with this, I would like to uh, thank my uh, group members, collaborators, which, uh, uh, for example, Ronit is, is sitting here in the audience, and I'm waiting for a question about labeling or functionalizing hydrophilic polymer with hydrophobic drugs. Uh, different uh, funding agencies, and you for your time, and Lee for the invitation again. Thank you very much, and be very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, many thanks. Great work and also great presentation. I, have a, um, I, I particularly liked also your system when you looked also into cells. So basically, um, um, how, how the cells basically responded to different architectures. I think this is something which uh, many people actually ignore in their delivery system, which is, which is crucial. And you could show that tiny changes basically have a dramatic effect. I was wondering, do you know exactly what happens structurally if you are in a membrane environment, um, if, if your if you um, um, architectures basically enrich in the endoplasmatic reticulum, so in some organelles, or if they are in the cytosol, how, how architecture is changed so they by the surroundings? They seem that the ones that have, again, the lower degree of hydrophobicity, mm -hmm. once they see the cell membrane, they seem to fall apart kind of into the cell membrane, yeah. and go with this, they seem to exchange, again, from colocalization, and they go to the ER, if you wash the cells, they would also come out. And if you go to the ones that have more hydrophobic, they seem to go inside for, en for the endosome, and then they would yeah. be degraded or fall apart in the endosome. We are now following this actually in a microfluidic, so trying to create kind of a, a, a bl blood or synthetic blood vessels and studying them actually under, under flow. Mm -hmm. And with a cancer cell that are in a basically not spread, on, not spread on the plate, but, but actually uh, held together, and then see whether they can still flow and diffuse outside of, kind of again, our synthetic blood vessel and, yeah. and follow them into the gel and into the matrix and into the cells. And maybe one comment in this direction. Do you, um, so I think the dynamics of your system is extremely important. So um, how, how, how fast the fluctuation is. So I mean, um, and, and I think this also changes quite a bit. So um, with, the, with your hydrophobicity, do you know basically how, how, how no, the so, dynamic so changes? So we, we, we're starting to do more, more and more, uh, kind of more precise, I would say, kinetic experiments yeah. right now, as well as modeling of the system in order to understand the kind of, the, the, the rate of exchange, mm -hmm. now it depends on the hydrophobicity. So it's the ongoing work right cool. now. Just Very nice. Nice, really nice talk. Um, I was interested in the enzyme kinetics question. I don't know if you sort of had that within the NMR data, but it seems clear that you should be able to measure second order rate constants, et cetera, the enzyme. And do you see a, a difference between, so I, these are esterases, right? Um, do you see a difference? Is it enhanced? I mean, you're waiting, you're waiting on the substrate to become a substrate when it exits the micelle or is at the interface. But do you see that in the enzyme kinetics? Is it, is it different than uh, with its natural, with a normal substrate that's fully solvated? Yeah, then I actually skipped this slide. I'll go back for a second. So one of the questions we had here is whether the, the different rate of degradation is coming from the fact that you depend on this exchange and it changes with the hydrophobicity or whether it's a question of enzymatic specificity. So it might be that the enzyme prefers to cleave a certain enzyme, certain, uh, the shorter esters. So what we've done is we made this structure that have only one hydrophobic chain. 
And here the CMC is extremely high, so we can walk below the CMC, so it would be the equivalent of a, a soluble substrate. And you can see here that actually the longer chain is actually a better substrate. So in terms, in terms of the enzymatic specificity, it actually likes, prefers to cleave the, the, the longer hydrophobic part. But again, when you put them into the, mes into the masses, you depend on this exchange. And that's part of the, what understanding kind of the rate, the on-off is for this. So we do see a change in the rate. Of Okay, so um, let's thank Roy, right, and thank you. we have time later.